This podcast is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, who pledge an amount to contribute every month and in return get exclusive access to bonus content, merchandise discounts, and much more. If you'd like to join our family and help us continue to bring you the very best in audio drama, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n slash Gotham Variety. And now, from New York, the Gotham Variety Podcast in a unique series of theatrical productions. And here's your producer and host, Joe Rubenstein. Greetings and welcome to episode six of Gotham Variety. And tonight, we present a story by Stephen Crane, whose most famous work, The Red Badge of Courage, is about a war he did not experience firsthand, the Civil War. Uh, Crane was born six years after the last shot was fired. But tonight's story, The Sergeant's Private Madhouse, is about a war that he did experience firsthand, the Spanish-American War of 1898. Not as a soldier, but as a reporter in Cuba, he witnessed and, in at least one case, assisted troops in battle, carrying messages to company commanders. I won't get into the politics of this war, because like the Red Badge of Courage, tonight's story is not about politics. It's not about the causes of war. It's about the personal implications of war the soldier's direct experience, in this case, guerrilla warfare in the jungle. Crane lived in an era when the phrase traumatic stress did not yet exist. Soldiers who broke under stress or after the stress of battle were written off as weak, cowardly, or insane, and basically left to their own devices. But there's a secondary theme in tonight's story as well. The power of chance in human affairs as the surreal actions of one unraveling soldier play a crucial, if unintentional, role in the outcome of one horrific night. The Sergeant's Private Madhouse, right after this. You can follow us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. We're on Spotify as well. Check out our website at GothamVariety.com, where you can send us your comments and questions. And if you love what we're doing, we'd love a five-star review on the podcast platform of your choice. Reviews and ratings help keep our show on the charts, so more and more people can find us. The Sergeant's Private Madhouse Monday, July 4th, 1898. The moonlight is blue flame, its radiance lavished upon a wilderness of insects, stunted trees, and cactus plants. The shadows on the ground, pools of black, sharply outlined, resemble substances, luminous fabrics, not shadows at all. The land itself is desolation. You could easily imagine Cuba as one vast solitude, And then, you might wonder at the moon taking all the trouble of this splendid illumination. In one especially large cluster of shadows lies an outpost of 40 U.S. Marines. If it was possible to approach without encountering one of their sentries, you would stumble upon them, some sleeping fitfully, others seated upright, blankets tented over their heads, waiting to fight, maybe to die, bloodshot eyes set deep in green circles of exhaustion. You would be among them before your mind was made up, whether they were men or some new breed of devil. If one of them moves, he does it quietly, taking the time and care of one who walks across a death chamber. Lieutenant Hobson, the officer in command, reaches for his watch, and just the slight tinkling of the nickel chain is enough to make six pairs of red-rimmed eyes turn slowly to regard him. These he ignores as he leans down to speak with Sergeant Beasley. Luke, who's on sentry behind that big cactus plant? Dryden. Uh, I shouldn't have put him there. Too many nerves. Want me to go over? See what's what? Yeah, go see. Hobson, his back to a dwarf tree, watches the sergeant's progress for the few moments he can still see him, crawling from one shadow to the next. He waits to hear what should be Dryden's quick, low challenge, but minutes pass, and no sound issues from the direction of the sentry. God damn it. 
Beasley, in no particular rush to rattle the taut nerves of Dryden, slows his pace as he approaches the cactus. Hopson ought to have his head examined, sticking some punk recruit on night watch. He is not bothered by the fact that he can't yet see Dryden. Beasley knows that the sentry will have hidden himself in a way practiced by the men since that time last month, when a marine was killed on picket, dispatched by that deadly disease known as overconfidence. Should have turned by now. Finally, he arrives at a point where he can see Dryden seated in the shadow of the cactus. It feels obscene to be able to creep up to the very back of a G Company member on guard duty. Dumb bastard. Probably fell asleep. Tomorrow, back at camp, I'll make him wish he ain't never been. But now the sergeant hesitates. There's something wrong. Dryden doesn't look to be asleep. He looks dead. Beasley recalls the tale of his two comrades, who crept out to find that overconfident picket sitting against a tree. Upright enough, but with his throat slashed from ear to ear in a ghastly gaping smile. The sergeant freezes and gives the sentry's inscrutable back a long, hard stare. Dryden! Finally, Beasley moves close enough to reach out and touch Dryden's arm and finds himself looking into the wide, staring eyes of a man livid with fear. Beyond fear, he's gone insane. One look in those eyes and that's the story right there. Dryden, pull yourself together. They're out there, Sarge. You feel them? Where? That's regular skirmish line out there. I don't see a goddamn thing. Shuddering violently, Dryden moves his hand from his knee to his head and back again, repeating the gesture over and over, a strange signal only he can comprehend. But I won't fire, no. Because if I do, they'll see me for sure. And oh, how they'll pepper me. Dryden! Cut me all to pieces. Dryden, stop this. But maybe, maybe if they knew me, yeah, if they knew me, then maybe they wouldn't. Right, Sarge? They don't want to know you, dummy. They want to kill you. But there's nobody there. It's all in your head. No, no. They're out there. Everywhere. In the air we breathe. All right, look. Uh, go tell Hobson what you've seen. I'll cover your post for you. No. They'd see me. And oh, how they pepper me. Can't move. Can't breathe. If you don't breathe, you're invisible. The sergeant is facing a situation. He knows all too well that at night, a large or small force of Spanish guerrillas is never more than easy rifle range from any marine outpost, both sides maintaining absolute secrecy in regard to their real strength and position. Everything sits on a watch spring foundation. A single loud word might be paid for with a firefight involving 500 men. The slip of a foot, a rolling piece of gravel, could set the whole works in motion until various crews reported to general quarters on their ships in the harbor, batteries booming as the swift searchlight flashes tore through the jungle foliage. Men would die, notably he and Dryden. Outposts would be cut off, and the whole night would be one pitiless turmoil. And so, Sergeant Lucas H. Beasley commences to run his own private asylum at the post behind the cactus, the only way he knows how. Dryden. Dryden, you listen to me. I'm worse than any ten Spaniards, and that's on my best day. Now you get your ass moving, or I'ma deal with you, boy. I'll change your features, and I'll take my time doing it. I mean that. I'm sincere about it. Now get going. No. I, I don't dare. They'll see me. They're almost on us now. Almost right on top of us. Oh, yeah. Well, this is... <laughs> This is something else, boy. This here is special. That's what this is. I'm not even supposed to be here. Well, you are here. So quit crying about it. Boy, ain't you got any pride? I know. Let's hide. Yeah, Sarge, we'll hide. All right, look. You stay here, and I'll go, and I'll tell... No! Don't you stir. Don't. I know you. You want to give me away. You want them to see me. Don't you stir now. Discretion being the better part of valor, the sergeant elects not to stir. Instead, he becomes deeply aware of the slow wheeling of eternity. 
its majestic, awesome incomprehensibility. Minutes, seconds are quaint little things, tangible as toys, and there are billions of them, all alike. For him, it is no longer the end of the 19th century, but rather some alternative century, in which, strangely enough, he never joined the Marine Corps at all, but took to a different walk of life, and prospered greatly in it. Deadly insects down here. Scorpions. Trident, this is all a bunch of nonsense. Tarantulas. Be a man. Maggots, when you're dead, come crawling out your mouth. Oh, God. Beasley toys with the idea of smashing Dryden over the head with his rifle, but the sentry is so supernaturally alert that there would surely be some small scuffle and subsequent hell to pay. No. Can't be no dust-up. Spaniards hear it. We're sitting ducks. And so, the doctor adjusts his bedside manner and attempts to reason with his patient. Look, uh, Dryden, old-timer, he didn't see no Spanish. I'm sure of it. He just been drinking, right? Had some bad whiskey? Don't you stir. Sweet Jesus. Them gorillas do take a crack at us. They'll find a laughing house right up front. Now that'd be... <laughs> fun times, boy, fun times. There. I told you. You drew him here, dumbass. Now shut up or I'll shoot you myself. Oh, shit. The disaster now upon them, Beasley feels an odd sense of relief along with the adrenaline. He follows his first impulse, which is to grab his patient by the scruff of the neck, jerk him roughly to his feet, and drag him to the main outpost while returning fire. After reaching Hobson and the men, Beasley releases his grip on the madman, who slips out of sight and is quickly forgotten. It is a long night, and the battle takes its turns. The 40 Marines form an irregular oval, and from all sides, the Mauser rifle bullets sing out low and hard as the men seek to prevent a rush with systematic firing. The enemy are not regular Spanish forces, but a corps of guerrillas, native-born Cubans who prefer the flag of Spain. As fighting troops, they are formidable, especially in the wilderness at night. These Cubans have separated from the Cubans insurgent to Spain. Just as those Cubans fight the Spanish, these fight for the Spanish, against the Americans. It all makes perfect sense. Filthy jackals are everywhere. Yep, there goes the neighborhood. Think we can hold them? Hell if I know. Just keep spraying and praying. The moon is now hidden, and each Marine can barely see the comrade at his side. At times, the guerrillas creep so close that the flame from their rifles seems to scorch the men's faces, and the reports sound as if they're mere inches away. The enemy cannot be seen, but the Marines can hear them gabbing in a kind of drunken delirium. Hey, brother. Ammo's running real low. Yeah, hang on. Gotta get to daybreak. They'll take off then. But a black hour comes, when the enemy makes a wild attack on a portion of the oval held by just 15 men. The remainder of the force has its hands full, and the 15 are left to their own devices. Lieutenant? Yeah. We only got about one clip apiece. If them Spanish come hard, we're done for. All right, sit tight. Hobson crawls among the men, asking for clips of cartridges coming up empty. Then he spots Dryden shivering quietly with his head in his hands. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Dryden! Stop it, stop it, stop it. Snap out of it, goddammit! Stop it, stop it. Checking his impulse to strike the private, Hobson instead feels around his belt. Jesus. Look at this, Beasley. What's that, Lieutenant? Goddamn gold mine, that's what. Look at all this ammo. Check his rack. Full clip. Dumb mutt hasn't fired a shot. Looks like Dryden saved our bacon. Hey, give me some of that. All right, but just take what you need, no more. Then pass it on to the perimeter. Those boys are in a real shitstorm over there. Yeah, all right. The contest is far from settled. With Dryden's fresh supply of bullets, the Marines are only barely able to hold off the enemy, as the guerrillas fire from all angles, all directions, from up in trees. And then, amid the whirl of battle, a voice. The men. Who is that? I don't know, sir, but he ought to have a bayonet shoved down his throat. Hey, 
Hey! Got that squawking! Beasley, who the hell is that? God! Shut your goddamn pie hole! Go! Knock him out if you have to! The sergeant has pounced. But the singing has had an effect upon the enemy. When it began, they'd fired at the voice in a frenzy, but they soon ceased, perhaps from sheer amazement. The marines hold their fire as well, as both sides take a spell of meditation. Meanwhile, the sergeant is having some difficulty with his patient. Quiet, you devil! Here, take him by the throat. I'm trying, he's a slippery bastard. All right, I got him. Now hold him steady. Go. <clears throat> yep, that did it. The enemy does not come again. At the first indication of daybreak, the guerrillas fire their customary goodbye volley and depart. The exhausted marines lie tight while slow dawn creeps over the land. Now, where's that idiot? Here he is, Lieutenant. Wake him up. Hey, minstrel boy, turn out. Lieutenant wants a word. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, sir. So, you seem to be fond of singing, Dryden. <laughs> fond of singing, sir? That's right. Singing. It's okay, I guess. <laughs> I mean, sir. See if he has any whiskey on him. I checked. He ain't drunk. Just nutty as a Christmas fruitcake. <laughs> as Hobson and Beasley speak privately, the Marines, hitching their almost empty belts, speak with grins of the madhouse in their midst. Well, minstrel boys sure cleared out them Spanish, huh? Guess they just couldn't take it. <laughs> Clear out nothing. They were there. They just quit. Still, I wouldn't want to be in his boots. No? Be out of this mess. Yeah, but he'll see some fireworks when the general interviews him on a use of grand opera in modern warfare. <laughs> when the weary outpost is relieved and marches back to camp, the men cannot rest until they've told and then retold the tale of the voice in the wilderness. The story, which accumulates new details with each delivery, has quite a success. Meanwhile, the sergeant takes Dryden aboard ship and transfers his patient to more experienced hands. This here's Private Dryden, Doc. How you feeling, Private? Pretty good, I guess. Dryden here, he's... Well, he's quite an individual. In fact, he's a bloody marvel. Is he? Oh, yeah. Likes to hoard his ammo in the middle of a firefight. Though it did come in handy in a tight spot. I'll give him that. <laughs> Thanks, Sarge. Got Hell's own set of pipes on him, too. Wiped out them Spanish with just one song. <laughs> Is that a fact? Or was it two, Dryden? Well, I don't rightly know, Sarge. I guess I don't remember. That's all right. Anyway, Doc, you take good care of our boy here, because Dryden, well, he's just about the most useful goddamn crazy man in the service of these United States. Well, that's fine. Come along, son. The Minstrel Boy, which you heard Dryden sing during the episode, and then American tenor James McCool perform on that old recording at the end, that song was written by Irish poet Thomas Moore around 1800 and became a favorite of many Irishmen who fought during the Civil War and subsequent wars as well. And that recording was made in 1905, just seven years after the conclusion of the Spanish-American War, which I thought was kind of cool. In tonight's cast, Vince Phillip played Sergeant Beasley and one of the anonymous soldiers. Robert Gelfand was Private Dryden. Clay Westman played Lieutenant Hobson. Adam Barato was the doctor. And Mike Pollock played the other anonymous soldier, the one with the lower voice. The story by Stephen Crane was adapted by yours truly. I did change most of the dialogue to a mode of speech that I felt was more 
uh, realistic. You know, Crane lived in an era where censorship was very real, and some of his dialogue seemed kind of proper to me uh, for a bunch of tough Marines in the middle of a battle, but the story and most of the narration is Stephen Crane's, and I did the music and sound as well. Final thoughts right after this. Your feedback is important to us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash gothamvariety and subscribe. Stephen Crane packed a lot of life into his short time on the planet. Uh, His later years were unfortunately marred by poverty and illness. He was actually shipped home from Cuba from the war after taking sick and diagnosed uh, with yellow fever, then malaria. Uh, After he recovered, he moved to England where he befriended some of the great writers of his day, Joseph Conrad, Henry James, and H.G. Wells, but then suffered a series of pulmonary hemorrhages ended up traveling to a health spa on the edge of the Black Forest in Germany, and it was there that he died of tuberculosis in June of 1900 at the age of 28. And he was quite famous during his life. His eccentric uh, bohemian lifestyle, his association with other famous authors, his status as a journalist, uh, unconfirmed rumors about drug use and alcoholism. There was a scandal involving a prostitute in New York, and then later his expatriate status. All this made for a very good copy. Uh, But 20 years after his death, he was pretty much a forgotten man until those friendships with famous authors paid posthumous dividends as many of them pushed for Crane biographies and anthologies, Hemingway among them. He did not know Crane, uh, but he admired him greatly, and he stated in 1934 that Crane, Mark Twain, and Henry James were the three great American writers, and Joseph Conrad uh, was Crane's champion as well, calling him, quote, an artist and a seer, with a gift for rendering the significant on the surface of things, as well as an incomparable insight into primitive emotions, unquote. And coming from Conrad, that's high praise indeed. Well, it's time to close. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, and we'll see you back here in a few weeks for the seventh and final story of our first dramatic season here on Gotham Variety. Happy New Year, happy 20s, and I will see you soon. Take care. Take care.